Welcome to the Swine Nutrition Black Belt Podcast, the latest swine nutrition research digested for you. I'm your host, Clayton Chastain, and today we have with us Dr. Stacy Crowder, a product manager at Lando Lakes. So Dr. Crowder, would you mind telling us a little bit about yourself and what it is you do? Sure. Um, I'm Stacy Crowder, and I've been with Lando Lakes for over 10 years, and I've been a swine nutritionist all of those years here, um, and I've been a swine nutritionist in the industry for 15 plus years, focused on uh, young animal as well as late finishing nutrition for pigs. Awesome. So to my understanding, you're going to be talking about um, this E. coli and activating uh, functional fiber. Uh, I saw a study that your team performed testing it in nursery pigs when they were challenged with E. coli. Could you tell us a little bit about that study and what this fiber does exactly? Sure. Um, the, the functional fiber product is called Interid, um, and we've done some research looking specifically at pathogenic bacteria and getting pigs started. Um, so if we think about young animal nutrition in the industry today, uh, one of the biggest issues we face is feed intakes as well as post weaning scours. So when we have scours, we're losing performance um, for those nursery pigs. And so we focused on really what can we do nutritionally, what's happening at the gut level of those pigs that's actually causing the scours. So like I said, I've been a nutritionist for a lot of years and our nutritional solution has been to just add more fiber into those diets. And so when we start thinking about, are we treating the symptoms or are we treating the cause of those scours? I really would uh, probably say that adding the fiber to those nursery diets, we're really just addressing the symptoms of those scours. We're firming up those stools um, and getting those pigs back on feed. And so from a research and development, we focused on really what's happening at the gut level of those pigs, what's causing those scour issues. And so it's led us to look specifically at a lot of E. coli, so F18s, K88s um, in the barn, as well as some salmonella. And as we look at diagnostics across the industry, we found that some of those bacteria are becoming increasingly drug resistant. And so we're just running into a lot of issues in clearing those up in the barn. And so we started to focus on that young animal. They're being weaned into that barn. They have low feed intakes. And so that leads to like a low level of intestinal nutrition. And when we have intestinal um, gut function that is inhibited or impaired by gut development by intakes and or, and or scours, then that's where we start to compound the problems and we start to lose performance and, and cost producers money in the end. And so the Interid product in the research trial that you're mentioning is an E. coli challenge study where we specifically looked at K88 E. coli. And we did this in a research facility um, that has an E. coli challenge model that has been successful at uh, achieving a subclinical infection. So with E. coli challenges we run into, we either have a really, really hard challenge or a strong challenge and we have high mortalities and that limits our power to pick up differences or we end up on the other end of the spectrum where it's such a mild infection that we don't see the true differences in the treatments that we're testing. And so we worked with a, a facility that actually has a very good successfully uh, researched model to to cause a subclinical infection. So we had 72 pigs um, on three treatments. We had a positive control, a negative control, and then we had the negative control plus um, the entire product. And what we looked at was we inoculated pigs on day 10 and day 11, and then we took fecal samples daily uh, up to day 20. And we measured E. coli shedding um, and duration of shedding throughout that, this study. And so what we saw was that, of course, our positive control, you know, they were not infected, so they stayed negative. There was no E. coli shedding in the fecal material. And on um, day 11, after we inoculate on day 10, we see a nice spike in our um, challenged control, and they don't return to negative or to the positive control levels until past day 15. Um, and then when we implement the uh, product in Terrid into the diet, what we saw was that our peak shedding on day 11 was actually reduced um, significantly. And then by day 13, we were already seeing fecal shedding E. coli levels in the fecal material that were back to that of the control. So when we look at overall, it was um, a reduction in the peak shedding as well as the duration of shedding. And so when looking at or thinking about the industry and bringing a solution when we think about um, 
the amount of E. coli in the barns and what producers are dealing with, a lot of the E. coli scours happen in the first three to five days after placement. And so making sure that uh, the product is or the functional fiber is included so that we can inhibit that ability of the E. coli to, to colonize and to, um, to cause the scours. And so the functional fiber piece of this product, if, if we think about that, is how it's working, is it's agglutinating the pathogenic bacteria. And we've looked at this a couple of different ways. We've looked at this in microscopic agglutination, where we apply the, the product under the microscope, and then we visually see the clumping together. And that's, that's great to show visually what's happening, but the quantification of that is limited. And so then we went into uh, filtration agglutination, where we mix uh, the, a known amount of the bacteria with the product, and then we filter it through a, a filter that is specific to the size of the bacteria if it was unbound or not agglutinated together, that it would pass through. And so what we saw there was that we were able to um, agglutinate the K88. And then we took the residual that was left on the filter and we plated it because we wanted to see if could we capture the E. coli in the gut of the animal, which is what the agglutination assay is going to show us. But then can we also keep it in an inactive state in the fecal material? And so we carried that into to a plating assay and then counted um, E. coli colonies and found that 78% of the bacteria that was bound with the product through agglutination actually didn't grow um, when we plated it. So thinking about the disease um, cycle in a barn is that the E. coli is shed in the fecal material, other piglets then nose through that fecal material, and that cycle of infection keeps going. And so being able to actually stop that cycle of infection, as well as agglutinating the pathogenic bacteria, is going to be able to positively impact piglet performance. So with the way this works with like glu or agglutinating or clumping up of those bacteria, does that only work with strains, E. coli strains like F18 and K88? Um, and can it also be applied to, say, like other bacteria, such as salmonella or strepsuis? So that's a great question. And, and so thanks for asking that, Clayton. Is, uh, so the agglutination is specific to the, the fimbriae, um, so pathogenic bacteria like E. coli, salmonella. We've tested um, F18, K88, salmonella typhimurium, and salmonella enteritis uh, are the bacteria we have focused on. And um, the agglutination process, it's targeting that, that fimbriae of the pathogenic bacteria in how it's going to bind along the intestines. Um, and so that's what we're seeing when we look at it under the microscope as well. And so those are the four bacteria that we have focused on. We've actually looked at good bacteria. So some of the lactobacillus um, in the gut, we've, we have applied this product to those as well in filtration assays and showed that we don't have any negative binding of, of the good bacteria. So is it then pretty specific in how it functions? Like if you were to apply it to different bacteria, you'd almost have to like target different receptors. Is that kind of, am I understanding that right? Yeah. So we're focusing on, um, so those bacteria are going to bind uh, through either a carbohydrate or an epitope there, all, there along the gut um, to a specific, specific receptor. Um, you also, so we've done LPS challenge models also where just looking at straight LPS. So as the bacteria is broken down in the intestines, you know, the LPS then reacts with those receptors, which uh, starts a signaling cascade for inflammation. And what we've shown in those assays is that we actually don't see the activation of pro-inflammatory um, cytokines. And specifically, we focused on the gene expression of NF-kappa beta, uh, which is a critical step there in um, the development of those pro-inflammatory markers. So we know we can block that, which means that at the receptor level, we're preventing that bacteria from interacting at the gut level. Gotcha. Well, I appreciate you coming on the show and sharing all that with us. It seems really interesting and it's a kind of a, I like how it's a different approach to the typical um, treat the symptoms and not the root cause kind of thing. Um, so yeah, thank you for coming on and sharing about that. Thank you for having me. Yeah, and to everyone else, thank you for listening to the Swine Nutrition Black Belt podcast. Please visit us at swinenutritionblackbelt.com and don't forget to subscribe to our podcast channel so you won't miss out on the next episode. See you next week. Hey everyone, I hope you enjoyed this episode and we are constantly on the lookout for the latest updates in swine nutrition. 
And if you have a swine nutrition related research trial that you would be able to share on our podcast, please send an email to nutritionblackbelt at swineit.com and we would love to talk about your research. See you later.